Sandy, before we summarize our, our visit, um, has, have the endpoints in kidney cancer changed? Are we now really thinking about overall survival as, as the thing that patients really want and, and we'd like to give them as compared to things a decade ago when we're looking for incremental progression-free survival, which I have yet to have a patient ask me for more progression-free survival? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, with so many agents up there, that's the next, we've become like breast cancer doctors. It's nice to have this many choices. And uh, the good thing, I think, about kidney cancer is that many of these are not cross-resistance. I mean, there is still VEGF dependence. So even if a patient uh, uh, progresses on one drug, we have the opportunity to give them additional drugs. I would hope that uh, physicians are not quick to switch just so that they could get immunotherapy or put them on nivolumab. Like was mentioned before, there are patients, I mean, the uh, nivolumab trial did allow two prior therapies. So an alternate strategy that I might just post uh, that Nizar said was, if a patient has had a long response to a TKI, I, I don't think it would be wrong to continue with another TKI and do nivolumab as a third option. So I think there are many choices, but to come back Back to your uh, endpoint, I think uh, it's nice that we have raised the bar up and look for overall survival and perhaps even cure as a possibility for these patients. This has been a great discussion. We have reviewed and discussed a lot of information on the latest in the treatment of advanced kidney cancer and we can, what we can expect to see in the near future. Before we end today's discussion, I'd like to get some final thoughts from each of the panelists. And I'd like you to focus on several things in your concluding remarks. Endpoints, um, how do we develop new drugs in this space? Uh, absence of complete responses, uh, the, the things that are going to make, make it the next leap forward for kidney cancer patients as it has in other diseases. Martin, your thoughts? So I think um, it's certainly, um, exciting times to um, be developing drugs in kidney cancer and for our patients I think it's remarkable to think back to the beginning of the last chapter when the randomized sunitinib versus, uh, versus interferon trial put an end to the cytokine area um, and introduced VEGF TKI as the new standard and if you think back to that um, the median progression-free survival for cytokines at the time was short of six months and see where we are now as we enter sort of the next step beyond VEGF and mTOR inhibitors going into the era of adding uh, checkpoint inhibitors to this agent. We have since then, you know, pushed the progression-free survival, pushed the overall survival um, into the range of around uh, 30 months. And the fact that we have all these agents available is certainly wonderful news um, for our patients. I think if I were to have to emphasize one thing moving forward is that as we have um, more drugs in our armamentarium, um, and choices get to be more complex, uh, the development of biomarkers is going to be key. And we haven't spent too much time talking about that today, but I think not only in non-clear cell kidney cancer, which is a heterogeneous group of different diseases that need to be better defined to define targets, uh, within clear cell kidney cancer, we need to define uh, biomarkers that can help us uh, choose next steps, biomarkers that can be instituted not only at the time of diagnosis, but maybe also as we sequence patients. Uh, what are tests that we can develop to know whether after a TKI, the next step should be another TKI, or maybe an mTOR inhibitor, because there are some tissue markers that push us in that direction. Or maybe that patient is going to be exquisitely sensitive to a checkpoint inhibitor. Um, looking at other diseases, such markers can be found. I think a lot of effort should go into that uh, um, direction. Nizar? Yeah, I agree with Martin. I think uh, there are th several unmet needs. I mean, certainly we have come a long way from the days of cytokines. Uh, patients are living longer. It's a chronic disease, uh, but we're still not curing uh, many patients, unfortunately. We need to break the barrier. We need to break that cure barrier. And I think it is going to come from uh, understanding uh, the biology, understanding the immune system and the biology of these tumors. And so the unmet need, uh, which is acute right now, is the non-clear cell uh, space. The non-clear cell histologies uh, and patients with metastatic non-clear cell RCC, you know, constitute around 20% of the 
uh, total population. So those uh, patients are not, we do not have established therapies for those patients. As we mentioned already uh, today during this visit, the target agents that we have right now do not work that well, except for perhaps for the chromophobe histology. So we need to do better here and it has to come not uh, one trial like we did with the SPN and Aspen where we enroll all the patients with non-clear cell on TDS trials, but have uh, tr specific trials for each of these histologies f f uh, uh, grounded or uh, based, founded on the biology, on understanding what are the pathways, the key pathways or the key mutational uh, drivers of those diseases. Uh, I think the, uh, our discussion about sequencing and what are we doing for our patients today is going to change quickly. This is a, a rapidly evolving landscape because, as we discussed, uh, there are several trials in the first-line setting combining immune checkpoint inhibitors uh, with themselves, like, for example, the nivolumab epirumumab phase 3 trial checkmate 214 study, which could be uh, the next standard of care in the first line and will change completely, uh, you know, will uh, uh, throw upside down the field or how we are sequencing the patients. So, I mean, obviously, uh, time uh, is exciting for our patients, but I think uh, it, is not, it is also important to address uh, the toxicities as we discussed, uh, cost. I think, you know, we cannot leave this uh, discussion without talking about uh, cost and how can we make these expensive therapies that have revolutionized the field uh, more effective and how can society afford those expensive therapies. I think this is a totally different discussion for another day perhaps, but I think we should not forget that this is going to be also a challenge. Sandy? Um, the last decade was about uh, VEGF TKIs. I think the next decade will be about immunotherapy and how to integrate immunotherapy into uh, with the existing drugs that we have. I think it, I'm going to echo the, uh, my other two panelists that it's going to be a smarter selection of how to sequence drug based on some biology. So like they do in lung cancer, with each progression we might have to do biopsies to figure out what's appropriate for the next step. I'm also going to think, I'm going to say that uh, toxicity management is going to become more crucial now than ever before because we're going to start thinking about survivorship issues. Patients are living longer. You know, what's the effect of uh, 10 years of a VEGF inhibitor on patients in terms of um, effects on the heart, hypertension, and the other things that it has? Uh, patients with uh, the immune toxicities may end up having irreversible side effects, especially things like uh, pituitary and hypophysitis. So what's the effect of all of those in replacement? So I think we have a lot of work cut out, and it's exciting that there are more questions uh, to be answered. I just want to remind you that the decade before the targeted era decade was the immunotherapy era. <laughs> we are back in. We are, we are yeah, back coming in full circle. circle. Thank you so much.